Welcome to Searching for Shinies, the football sticker book podcast with Ketch and Richie. Hello and welcome to Searching for Shinies, the football sticker book podcast. Richie, we're doing the pilot, finally. We're doing it, yeah. Absolutely buzzing to be here. We've put a lot of effort into this in, in pulling together networks of footballers and digging out stickers out of our lofts and looking through our, our sticker books so it's uh, it's class to finally be on air so to speak let's describe what we're trying to do here we've got a pair of 1997 merlin premier league sticker albums in front of us and we're collecting stickers again but not as you would traditionally know it yeah so the idea is that in this in the 1997 merlin sticker book there's something like 320 players and with that there are thousands of untold stories so we want to reconnect with these old players, give them a platform to tell some of these tales from the 90s, which um, likes of myself and Ketch will absolutely gobble up. And for the first episode, we've got some 1990s football royalty, a household name, I think, for a 90s football fan, Nottingham Forest and England under 21, Steve Chettle. Yeah, could you be more 90s than Steve Chettle? We're joined by someone who appeared in the 1997 Merlin Premier League sticker book. This player made 174 Premier League appearances across five seasons in the top flight. He has a League Cup winner's medal, an FA Cup runners-up medal, and two full members' Cup winner's medals. He represented England at under-21 level 12 times, played for the likes of Ron Atkinson, Dave Bassett, Frank Clark, and Mr Brian Clough. It is, of course, Nottingham Forest legend Steve Chettle. Steve, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, fellas. Nice to be on. Nice to speak to some uh, other people apart from people in my house. Well, welcome. Thank you very much. So we've got this sticker book here, Steve, and you appear on page 88. There is 16 stickers in our books. We wondered if you could name the other players who appear with you on the Nottingham Forest spread. Oh, crikey. Um, 96, 97 season. Mark Crossley. Correct. Uh, Alan Rogers. Alan isn't there. No. Is it not? No. Well, okay. Uh, here we go then. So, my, just so you're aware, I've had to go and do some research today on the 90s because my memory is horrendous. <laughs> Literally is horrendous. My wife tells me all the time I'm around. She don't remember anything. So, this is my go-to get out for most questions that you asked me tonight, by the way. So, I've got about 15 left. You've got Crossley, so you've got 14 to go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, myself and the norm. Uh, 97. Matthew Louis Jean. No. No. <laughs> Andy Johnson. No, you're way out. You need to go. How many years Later. am I out? 96, 97 season. Oh, 96. Oh, that's when we had a decent team, was it? Oh, we, oh no, be, that's the year, that was a year after. So, Dean Saunders. Yes. Uh, Nicola Yurkan. Great one. Yeah, he was off the back of the Euros. A fantastic signing, shall we say. Pierre van Hoydonk. Not there yet. Not there yet. Uh... There was a Geordie. Can you get the Geordie? So Stoney. Yeah, Stoney. One's, one's a Borough legend. Colin Cooper. Correct. Uh, was Des Little still there then? No. He might have been. He's not there as a sticker. Right. Only, only 16 <laughs> can I, can I claim? Can I, can I claim the, the shiny tricky tree? <laughs> <laughs> so you're missing an absolute forest legend. Oh, really? Yeah. Pierce. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. But I thought it was late. I thought he'd already left by then. Uh, I should have done more research, right? Shouldn't I? It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> we can help you out. Scottish, How many left? Scottish midfielder. Scott Gemmell. Yeah. Uh, Double barrel name guy. Chris Park Williams. Yes. Yeah. Kevin Campbell there, then, was he? Yeah. Someone who scored two or three incredible free kicks in one year. That's my memory of him. Ian Wong. Yeah. One uh, player's son is doing very well in, in the modern game. Oh, wow. Crikey. Scandinavian. Oh, Alfie and Lars. Were they both there, were they? Alfie Inger Haaland in Lars, but he nearly oh, left Lars. Lars, Lars isn't there, Lars. Yeah. Lars isn't there. Yeah, but he comes later. Who was that? How many is that then? Must be, that must be it, surely. Come 12, on. 12. You you're, miss, you're, you're missing three. Uh, all three? Forwards. Forwards. You're missing forwards. A, Dutch, a Dutch winger, stroke forward. Brian Roy? Yeah. Yes. Two to go. Oh, should remember Brian. See, if he'd have got Norm on this, Norm would just crack through him, seriously. His memory's unbelievable. <laughs> and more forwards, you say? Two forwards, yeah. One no. Londoner, one guy from Oxford. Chris Allen? Yes. Yeah. Jason Lee still there? Yes. Is? yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Crikey. That's taken an hour. That's an hour gone. <laughs> it's been great oh, yeah. having you on. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. 
the next question was going to be, are you in touch with many of these guys? Obviously, we know you're in touch with Crossley. But... I speak to Norm. Uh, still speak to Wony occasionally. Still speak to Colin. Uh, wish Kevin Campbell happy birthday a couple of weeks ago. Mm-hmm. But it, it's like most things, fellas, to be fair. We, you know, people do the time together. We promise to keep in contact. And now you know, it's a little bit easier now with social media and everything else. Mm-hmm. But people just do go the separate ways. Uh, but I was very close with Coops. Played 20 ones with Coops. Obviously, he came down, uh, went from Middlesbrough to Millwall, and then we took him from Millwall. And we got family who are very uh, similar ages. So the kids are similar ages. And we got along really, really well. So he was my roommate for a few years. Mm-hmm. So he's probably one of my best mates. And like I say, Norm uh, was a part of the furniture like myself until we left in 99, uh, around about the same time, the same as Wony. Uh, but, you know, the people, life goes on. But like I say, they're probably the three people that I keep in contact with the most. Did you ever get a testimonial? Having done the... I did get a testimonial. Yeah, 1999, I got a testimonial. The year after Pierce, he had his against Newcastle sellout. I had an injury. I didn't play in that. I had a hernia. But mine was the year after. We played Leicester the week after they just got beaten in the League Cup final by Spurs, which was a bit of a kick in the teeth. But, you know, to get granted testimonies is a big, big honour. And I think I think there was about seven or 8,000 there, which is perfect for people to turn out to watch me. So, yeah, it was a good, it was a good career. And the end of it all was a testimonial. But uh, some ups and downs, shall we say. I've got that you played... 527 games for Forest in what yeah. must be about 13 seasons or so. Uh, it was 13 and a half. I left in 99. I went there in 85 straight from school. Mm-hmm. So I'm my first pro in 87. I made my debut then as well. So, yeah, so I think third all time list behind Bob McKinley, who had well, crikey, hundreds and hundreds more games than myself, and Ian Bowie, who's got a handful more than me. But mm-hmm. I got six more than Stuart Pierce. Funny enough, the next question was going to be a little quiz question who got the most? Uh, so your memory yeah. isn't that bad, Bob McKinley. Six, no, I checked that. Six hundred ninety-two well is the number I've got for him. Yeah, <laughs> you played under some unbelievable managers at your time in Forest: Brian Clough, Frank Clark, Stuart Pearce, Dave Bassett, Mickey Adams, Ron Atkinson, David Platt. But you know, there's only one place we can start. Tell us all about Mickey Adams. <laughs> <laughs> I'll thought you were going to start with David Platt. The reason why I left. <laughs> oh dear. Well, we can do both. But. Uh, Obviously, the big man, uh, Richie's, Richie's from Middlesbrough, uh, legend of, of, of the 90s. Can you remember the first time you met Cluffy? I do. Uh, it was myself and Phil Starbuck. We'd uh, just signed associate schoolboy forms at the age of 14. And this man is obviously... I, I've been to watch Forest since they were in the second division in 1976 with my dad and watched them play European Cups. I saw them beat Liverpool at home in the first round of European Cup. Obviously, watched them on the TV for the European Cup finals, but... To meet him himself was was a, was a bit scary. We went in there, sat down. He had a conversation about you know about the football club and everything else. And on the way out, he said, "Lads, have you taken anything?" And I, I was listen, I was petrified. I went, "No, no, 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 Mister Gough, not a thing." Phil Starr said, "Yeah, so oh, wait, I've nicked an ashtray." I was like, well, "Where'd you go from that?" And, but it, it was a uh, it was it was a really really hard man to work out. He made you feel great when you're having a rough time, but if you thought you'd made it, he'd he'd knock you down five or six pegs or two. So it was a great learning curve when we left school to, for, to be a first boss. And, you know, I'm, I'm the envy of a lot of people. I do know that. We had Martin Scott as a, as a guest on a future episode of our podcast. Uh, he came on loan to Forest in the late I did, 80s. I was there, yeah. He told us a story about bibs, and we were wondering if you could verify this. He said that Cluffy would throw bibs into the middle of the dressing room, and if you didn't get one, you didn't train. Did that ever happen to you? <laughs> I don't know. I don't remember that. So, yeah. Must be one of the Scottish special sessions. <laughs> well, he, he never he never played actually for us, so uh, maybe that tells us something. He said that if you didn't get one of the bibs, you were told in no uncertain terms to f off out the room, basically, and you didn't get to drain. Well, when, when you were injured, you were surplus to requirements because she used to lock the physio's room door. He said, "You know, you used to be injured. You might as well go home." So that was one way of getting people fit, I suppose. <laughs> Did he ever make you do any uh, of his gardening or playing some? Yes, team? Oh, I yes. was. I was on the gardening rotor. I was on the dog walking <laughs> rotor. So every morning when you used to come in, you used to hear Del Boy the dog coming first, and it was like it was like just run for the hills, everybody <laughs> hiding because you knew was you were either going to be walking his dog or going up to his house to do the garden. So the minibus used to go up there most mornings with five or six scholars on there. It was a great day out of his garden. It's just it was like painting the fourth road bridge though it was huge <laughs> so you're getting leaves from the top by the time you get back to the bottom the top's full again so you're there all day but he used to cook dinner for you he used to let you look around his study lots of old photographs of famous people and you know checks of the manager of the month um vhs videos of all the games so you can you know help yourself to his stuff but he, you know he's a great host but this this isn't when you're actually a professional then. this is when you're an apprentice you're not missing no training. this is when an apprentice yeah so when we're when we're 16 17 before we signed pro yeah, he used to be on the road, and if you just collie, he used to have to clean his shoes and 
yeah, just do bits that, you know, you just class as normal for us. I don't think you get away with it now. I don't think many people are cleaning Jurgen Klopp's shoes or going to his house, to his garden. What kind of dog was Del Boy? Was he, was he friendly? He was a gone Labrador. Unbelievable. So was he an yeah. only fool's fan, Brian? I, well, he must have been, yeah. It was called Del Boy the dog, so I'm guessing so. <laughs> do you have any particularly, uh, particular highlights of, of Cluffy, like of funny stories or travels or? I, I, some, I signed my first contract in 1987 and we were just about, myself and Phil Starbuck, and we were just about to go away to Sweden pre-season. Um, we both got a call into the manager's office you know, just before the bus was about to leave and he said, oh, the guff wants to see you. So we both had to go in. And as I went in, he said, Lads, I want to offer you both. I'm not going to do the, I'm not going to do the uh, impression like Norm does. Uh, <laughs> so he said, I want to offer you both a deal. I said, right, okay. Uh, he said, I'm going to offer you both £100 a week. You've got 15 minutes to decide where you want to sign. Come back to me then. So we went outside, myself and Phil. We were, we we're on in the vast of £35 a week on this new training scheme now by this stage. So I went outside and myself being a little bit uh, braver than him, spoke up and said, uh, listen, we really could do with a few more quid than £100. We're going to be professional footballers. So we went back in, uh, myself and Phil. Uh, he said, so lads, what are you going to do? I said, well, oh, Gaffey, it's my first professional contract. I'm on £35 now. I was, I'd hope in, really, for a few more quid if possible. He went, right, OK, I'll have your tracksuit then. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> he said, I'll have your tracksuit. I said, well, I've only got my T-shirt and my pants and my socks. And he went, yeah, I'll have your tracksuit. <laughs> so I took my tracksuit off stood in his office in my t-shirt my pants and my socks he said i'll have that you're not coming away pre-season they said starby what are you gonna do and gaffer i'll sign <laughs> <laughs> so we so we went away uh i didn't go i stayed at, i stayed back in england for pre-season when we got back uh he offered he offered me more money than the hundred pound uh, when we got back and signed a new deal so i don't know whether it was a test uh, that stood up to the test but uh in the end I do know that the next contract that signed was the first five-year deal that anybody signed at Nottingham Forest after that. So he did look after me an awful lot. Yeah. You, how did you feel, though, when you knew you weren't going away? That must, You must have had a bit of a sinking feeling at that point. Yeah, it was, a, it was a bit of a kick in the balls. I had to ring my dad to come and pick me up because, you know, it's your first it's your first big break, really, going away pre-season. Mm. Uh, but like I say, there's, it, it, was a, it was a long game. Mm. It was a long game in the end and, the, and it paid off for me. You had to get your dad to come and pick you up. Are you still in your pants at this point? <laughs> Yeah, same with pants. I had, to go and get my, I had to go and get my bag out of the room at least, put some, uh, some, put some trousers on. Okay. Unbelievable. I'm interested in, in Cluffy's training methods. All we hear about his training is, is sometimes it would be a walk down the Trent and that go home, lads. He, he seemed to have a, a nouse for no one went to rest you and no one went to run you. How did you find it? I don't know, I don't know when we were going to be ran because I've, I've never in any of those sessions. We would <laughs> literally walk from the ground, come hello, high water, sunshine, rain, snow, always walk down the river as players, uh, get to the training ground, do a couple of laps with Liam or with Archie Gemmel around as a train, do a few little what they call doggies, five, 10 metre runs. And then it was five sides. But we only had the, the tiny little goals, which would be probably three yards by two yards to play with. So if we have a really good session to start the five aside and we go pass, 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 shot, volley, goal, it, it could last three minutes. Go, oh, we'll go on that, lads. <laughs> and, and we'd leave. So that would be a session. We said, well, we've only been here 20 minutes, Gaffer. Then come on, we're going. Then some days we'd go walk, just walk down the river. In the winter, we'd go for a cup of soup at the cafe at the end of the bridge of the River Trent. Uh, if it was nice in the summer, we'd go for an ice cream. We'd just go for a walk. We One day when the, near the end of the gaffer's reign, they brought some fitness people in. And next door to training guys, a place called Lady Bay, which had an indoor tennis court in. So the guys set up with all their dumbbells and their weights and you know all their training mechanism. When the gaffer came into the, the indoor tennis arena, he looked at it and went, what's this? Why am I having this? And we walked out, went to play five aside again. So the training <laughs> methods were kind of uh, not a limit, I wouldn't say, but I think they they got to a point where, like I say, Premier League came in, Arsene Wenger came in, the game changed, and we didn't adapt, and it kind of bit us on the ass. You talk about go for walks along the Trent. We've heard a story that you once rescued a dog from the river and got into trouble. I rescued with the a dog. Yeah, this, I, this was this was in the uh, I think it was in the David Platt phase. I'm not saying his sessions were bad, but I was training with the kids. wasn't making twenty man squads. Uh, and there was an old lady, bless her, who was struggling. Said, "I need us some help. A dog was stuck, uh, hanging onto a branch in the trent. So, me just wanted to get out of the session. Just jumped in the river, tried to drag this dog out. This dog wouldn't let go. Was, wasn't having it. So I had to haul this dog out the river. Uh, got it out. This lady got a dog. Went away. I, I, I went back to training. Oh, I didn't go back to training. So I went back to the dressing room to go and get changed. So I'm soaking. 
and they got my arse kicked by the local police and the press were being reckless. <laughs> but you were a superhero. You did save it. You saved the. Dog I was dog. a superhero. Yeah, I, I try and keep it under wraps. Yeah, not all heroes wear capes, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've got a list of your honours here, which Ketch obviously mentioned in the intro. So the first League Cup, nineteen eighty nine. You were on the bench in the final. Did you get I was a medal? On the bench, for that? Yeah, I didn't didn't come on for that game. No. So no medal. Yeah, medal. Oh, yeah, got medal. Got a medal. Yeah, got okay. medal. Got all the bonuses. Got the suit. Uh-huh. Uh, got all the trimmings, yeah, but just didn't go into the pitch for the uh, for the game. I was a looting game, yeah. So is that um, presumably that's relatively early in your forest career? Perhaps that was, yeah. I'd, I'd only oh, well, that was uh, yeah. I'd only be twenty. Well, no, I'd be nineteen. Be nineteen at that stage, yeah. But the year after, played again, played in the Oldham game. The year after, what kind of experience is that like? I mean, you've got three years in a row where you've gone to Wembley, and we'll come on to the the, the FA Cup one. But to have that experience, it must be something that you cherish. Or I mean, can you talk through? Yeah, it is. I, I played at, I played at Wembley seven times in various massive cups like the ZDS and the Simo <laughs> Trophy and the Mercantile Credit Classic. They're there to be won. So you get you get a medal, and it's it's an honour. It's, it's there forever. Uh, but like I say, two two league cups. Uh, didn't play in the '92 league cup against Manchester United. I was injured. But you know, to to go there at the old Wembley, which was still an iconic stadium, we were doing really well in the leagues and we we're doing really well in these cups. But there was no European football, so I missed out on European football for years. I mean, it wasn't until like I say the mid the mid '90s when we managed to qualify for the UEFA Cup that we did get that uh, chance to go play in Europe again. But no, great, fantastic. Fantastic occasions. The 90s was, I think, the last decade when the FA Cup was, you know, the centrepiece of the football season. The world tuned in. You played in the 91 final. It's quite a famous final for a number of reasons. It was a, you know, a lot of ebbing and flowing and the build-up with Gazera's injury. Can you remember much about the day or is it is it one of those where it was a, a bit of a blur? No, I, I don't remember much about the build-up. Uh, I remember the game. I've obviously watched reruns of the game occasionally. Uh and I think everybody knew from going down the tunnel in the first place where the gaffer's got his on the world's greatest granddad badge on and meeting the, meeting royalty, Princess Diana, uh, that Gaza was kind of excited. Uh, he was bouncing down the tunnel. And I think within the first three minutes when he nearly decapitated Gary Parker uh, and then nearly took Gary Charles' knees off, he was a, he was a bit overexcitable. And I, and I played with Gaza in the 21s. He's a, he's a lovely, lovely fella. And I met him on his rehab uh, by a complete fluke in Portugal. We were both on holiday at the same place at the same time. So, we, you know, we, we still spoke then. But, you know, I still say in, in hindsight, if Gaza would have stayed on the pitch, I think we'd have won. I think we'd have won the cup final. I think Naeem came on and did a better job than what Gaza was going to do. And in the end, you know, we lost out with the own goal with Des Walker. But Norm saved a penalty. Gary Lineker missed his penalty. And he just wasn't to be. Everybody thought our name was on the cup because Cluffy never won it. But, you know, football's not that easy. I was excited when we were researching for you to come on the show that your under-21 career kind of crossed over with Gaza's. And uh, I was wondering if you had any rare stories because we've heard the the famous ones about Tottenham buying his sister a sunbed and stuff like that. Have you got any rare ones from the, your time? No, we we went we went to, we went to Toulon, uh, a Toulon tournament, uh, and in the same group was Paul Gascoigne and Julian Dix. So it was a bit of a, a bit of a respite for disaster. And they were had a few beers at the end of one night after the tournament had finished, and ended up sword fighting with some metal chairs uh, in a bar in in Toulon. So. Yeah, it was another another quiet night out with Gaza. <laughs> Can you remember any other names from that, that team you played in? Uh, yeah, Michael Thomas, uh, Nigel Martin was the goalkeeper. Played with the lads from City, uh, Steve Redmond, Ian Brightwell, uh, who played in there. David Hurst played some of the games. Paul Lintz played in those, some of those games as well. And, you know, I I just, I was really, really fortunate. Even David Rowcastle, bless him, when I first got in the 21s, was still in the under-21 group as well. So it was a fantastic group to be around. I think my first two long tournament I went away with Nigel. Nigel was in the 21s at the same time as well. But, you know, I look at that as a really special time and something I'm really, really uh, proud to having in the 21s caps. You know, I, I didn't get to that cherished land of getting a full cap because there's better players out there. I mean, people have asked me before, how come we never got a full England cap? So, well, I wasn't good enough because there was better players around at the time. Uh, I think Steve Bruce only got one B cap, but, you know, and for how good Steve Bruce was as well. So, you know, I realised I was fortunate and I, and I take everything that I've got from in the 21s career. I've got my caps, got my shirts and got my memories. Mm-hmm. Did you ever feel close to the senior squad? No, not at all. We, we travelled with the senior squad, obviously. Uh, and at the time, Stuart was in the senior squad, Neil Webb, Steve Hodge, Des Walker. So we always travelled together and you did feel part of the the setup, even though you were separated when you got to the other end of the uh, the game where you were on and they went to their hotels, we went to ours. But 
know, really fortunate to be travelling with the, you know, the boys in the group and really privileged to play for my country. So we are a brand new football sticker book podcast and incredibly we've managed to secure a sponsor before we've even gone live with an episode and it couldn't be anyone better. It's Tops Match Tax, who were the company that bought Merlin at the end of the 90s. Now they do the Match Tax range, they do the Champions League stickers and they've agreed to support us and sponsor our podcast and they've even sent us some merch, haven't they Richard? They have, yep, and it's fresh out the box, it smells glorious and we're going to open some stickers, aren't we? So here goes. So these are the 2020-2021 Champions League match tax range for the Champions League sticker book. And we're going to open our first pack here. We're going to attempt to complete a sticker book each for the 2020-21 season. We haven't got long left, so we better get a move on. Richie, are you opening? I am, yes. And I've started off with N'Golo Kante. A, a big a big sticker as well. Oh. I don't know what that means. But he must be one of the main featured players on, on the Chelsea page. Chuff with that. I'm sort of practice opening stickers that... You know how you get a big sticker and a load of little stickers? You haven't ripped a big I've sticker, I've ripped my Jan O'Black. Oh, my God. I've ripped him. I've ripped Jan O'Black. <laughs> good start. That's a, I'm so out of practice. I haven't done this for 25 years, so that's not a good start. I've got a shiny, so I'm chuffed. Vedran Choluka, formerly of Spurs, and someone else in the Premier I've got League. a shiny. Marquinhos, PSG. Nice. Can you beat Vladislav Sobriaga from Dynamo Kiev? Yes. I've got Igor Somalinkov. He was a Russian player. Okay. Uh, I believe he's a defender. Okay, but he's no Alvaro Gonzalez of Marseille, is he? Great to see you, Alvaro. Welcome to the club. No, no, he's not. Bruges player here. Crepin Diada, Senegalese midfielder. <laughs> I've just won this game. Thomas Muller. It doesn't get no bigger than that. 115 <laughs> with you, Champions League appearances. I Phenomenal. Have Ajax midfielder, Jürgen Ecklenkamp. Mm-hmm. Infamous Dutch, and I've got uh, of Shakhtar Donetsk, Manor Solomon, Israeli, handsome chap. I've got a Michelin midfielder here who's never played in the Champions League yet, and he's never scored a goal in the Champions League, obviously because he hasn't played. Pioni Sisto. Ah, uh, and I've got another debutant here from uh, Sevilla, Brazilian Diago Carlos. Nice, very good. I've got Wojciech Chesney, oh, Italian dear. player. Wow, Polish. Right, I'm into the big boys now. The one and only Mr. Paul Pogba. Oh, are you kidding me? This is an incredible, <laughs> an incredible pack. I've got a very rare sticker. Dodo. <laughs> <laughs> Defender. And uh, yeah, I think he's, I think he's, uh, is, it Shaq, is he a Shakhtar player? I can't, I, it doesn't say the team. You've got so to I'm work guessing, out. it's guesswork. Is it an orange Looks, kit? Yeah, Eastern European. Yeah, if it says something like Jetap on the uh, yeah the badge, it's them. I'm going to reel off my last two here because what I'm going to save the best or last. I've got Abu Diallo from PSG, French chap, and then I have a Champions League winner in Mister Boring, James Milner. Oh, you've had a fantastic Get in. Fun. I got two more. Go. I got uh, Lazio player Francesco Asaribi and. I've got a Zenit player, Alexi Suterimin, midfielder. My packet was shocking. Thank Yours you, Tom. Much better. Get and I there. ripped Jan Oblak, which I'm pretty Must, do, must do better. Next week, I will not be ripping my big sticker. <laughs> <laughs> right then, let's get back to Steve Chettle. That's 92-93 when the Premier League starts. It's Cluffy's last season, and you played in the first ever televised Premier League game. Do you remember who? Yeah. Do you remember who was against? Yeah, it was Liverpool. Yeah, Liverpool. What was the score? And who Ted, scored? I think we, we, Teddy Sheringham scored one nil. I see. And this was this is a game where Mark Crossley steps out of his comfort zone and makes a really rash statement saying, "Lads, I fancy to do well this season." <laughs> <laughs> he's only he's only ever said it twice that year and the year when we got relegated. The last time when we beat Coventry the first day of the season, said it twice. <laughs> so as soon as he starts to spin, you just have to jump on him and keep keep your hand over his mouth. Yeah, Liverpool at home, uh, in front of the TV crowd. Uh, great game, great occasion. And then it didn't get much better than that, to be fair. I think at the start of that season, you sold Des Walker and Teddy Sheringham. Yeah. That was, I mean, what must have you been thinking when you see names like that leaving the club? Well, Des went to Des went out to Italy, I think. And, you know, Des was a fantastic fall for myself. You know, people shout, you never beat Des Walker. It's probably because they've normally beaten me. Uh, <laughs> but, but to, you know, Teddy came in and we lost Teddy really early. Uh, we didn't really replace 
uh, enough, and we, we just didn't we just didn't get the goals. We didn't get the goals that we needed to win games, uh, which is always the hardest bit. You know, if you can keep clean sheets, you're going to get a point. But we need we were playing catch up very very early on. Didn't score enough goals. I think Gary Bannister was there then, was he? Kind of that first year. So you know, we didn't we didn't get a lot of goals, and that, that probably cost us as well. Remind us, did Brian Clough say that he was going to leave at, at the end of that season, and then did that put a bit of extra pressure on you? Do you think Just give him a good? Sense? I don't know. He was, I think everybody could see it wasn't well. You could see physically he didn't look great. Uh, he started to you know, start to look old and start to look tired. And I think if we'd have won the FA Cup the year previous, I think it would have packed in. Uh, I think it would have packed in, got out on a high, but you know, I don't think it was his way to, to give in. But he had to for his own reasons, for personal reasons, for health reasons, uh, to do what he had to do. And it was just unfortunate that it, it happened that way around. You know, but I don't think it'll ever happen again where a team gets relegated and the fans of the manager that's just been relegated are on the pitch trying to carry him off, you know, like the king. I don't, it would never happen again. Did, did you talk as players during that season and say, oh, the gaffer doesn't look right here? Uh, not not as a main topic, no. But you, you know, we, we see him every day. He didn't come in an awful lot. He didn't go down the training ground an awful lot just because of those reasons. But it's not something that we talked about daily where we said, right, listen, we need to sit down. This We needed to know what we could do as players. And it directly has come down to us that we weren't good enough to get the manager out of the situation for him to survive another year. And maybe if we'd have kept him up, he would have retired that year. But listen, I, I don't know. But it was never really discussed that, you know, I don't think the gap is well. I think everybody, every man in his dog could see it for himself. So presumably the last few weeks, there must have been pretty emotional knowing that he was on his way out. Yeah, it was. We got beat by Sheffield United at home. And like I say, uh, the pitch invasion wasn't the usual pitch invasion of anger and asking for people's heads to be rolling. It was it was emotional. Uh, we got off there quickly. You know, he came back out and said bye to everybody as he would. And it, it was an emotional time. and But, you know, as a football club, there was an end of an era and something had to happen. And like I say, it was the hardest job for somebody to follow Brian Clough's footsteps for what he's achieved at the football club for so long. To bring in the guy that he did was a, was a masterstroke. Uh, and was, it was a great year after that as well. Obviously, going down, you, you lost a few big names. Roy Keane left. That must have been tough seeing players like him moved on. Can, can you talk a little bit about Roy? Obviously, he went on to become one of the best midfielders the British game has ever seen. Did you recognise that in him as soon as you saw him? Yeah, Roy came over, I think it was one night we were playing Liverpool away and there's this, well, he, he wasn't even a big kid then. He was just this strong looking, uh, wiry Irish boy that we didn't know who he was. He got on the bus with a carrier bag with a pair of boots in. And when we got to Anfield, this kid's playing. And we thought, what's going on here? And this, and this kid, well, we, we only knew he came from Cove Ramblers uh, for very, very little money. Uh, but you could see a talent in him straight away. He was unbelievable. He could play centre midfield like he did most of his career. He played right wing. He played centre back. He could play anywhere. I'm sure if you asked him to play in goal, it would have been fantastic. He's, he's one of the best players I've played with. He was a fantastic talent. But like I say, he had to go. He had to go into better things. And he, he didn't do bad for himself. What yeah. was his relationship with Cluffy like? I'm not sure, in all honesty. Uh, Roy... Obviously, came to Nottingham from Cork. I think Nottingham's a tad more lively than Cork. He enjoyed the hospitality that Nottingham provided, <laughs> shall we say? Uh, and he did. He did like a quiet night out, which normally turned out into a louder, uh, a louder night. But no, I, he enjoyed himself in Nottingham. He did really well for Nottingham Forest. Scored some great goals for Nottingham Forest, and he had a you know he had a really good time with us. But like I say, he, uh, he was always going on to bigger and better things. As the local man in the Forest team, then Steve, did you show Roy the local? The local sites? No, no, I was uh, happily settled by that stage. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> so, uh, we listen, I've been out on Christmas dues with Roy, uh, and I that was just one night of the year. I don't know what it'd be like going out once a week with Roy. I don't know where I'd coped. Yeah, puts away the Guinness, yeah? Well, most things, to be fair. <laughs> okay. <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> I was surprised by that, actually. I had my head that he would be the consummate professional. I'm not saying that he's been unprofessional there, but, um, you know, I think standards. I think in the in the latter part of his career, I did think he turned to that ultimate uh, professional. I think the uh, the tag of being a Manchester United player and all the trimmings that go with the Manchester United player, and obviously when he went up there, he was a, a well-established player, but he wasn't the big fish that he was, obviously, in Nottingham. And whether he could hide himself a little bit, and then I think he... He grew into this role of this professional footballer uh, later on in his career. 
It's hard to imagine him as a as a young player, but was he was he? I love watching him and I love listening to him talk about football now on on Sky. Was he cantankerous? Uh, could he be a bit moody? What was he like as a kid? Absolutely, he was opinionated. Uh, it was feisty. It was fierce. It was a born winner. Uh, he hated losing, even in five sides. Yeah, you could see he had all the trimmings to be successful. Uh, but yeah, he, he always had an opinion right from the beginning. I don't think he's never been backwards or coming forwards, and he still's not. Um, so moving on, you, you've already mentioned that um, you made a good appointment. So Frank Clark then joined the club after Cluffy in 93, 94, when you're in the old Division One, what is now the Championship. Yeah. Um, Collymore, Colin Cooper, and Bohinen also joined that year, and it was a pretty good year. It was a great year. It was a it was a huge transition period. I think Des Little signed that year as well. We took him from Swansea. It was a ma- another massive addition. Uh, but when Frank came in, he brought a fitness coach in with him, and we didn't know what a fitness coach was. <laughs> Uh, so there was a guy called Pete Edwards whose background was athletics uh, and he had this massively scaled pre-season plan for us and we could only do half of it because we were so unfit. We'd never, we'd never had anything like this before and it, it took us a bit of time to get going. But when we did get going, we, you know, we, we roared through that league. I know we only finished runners-up Palace, uh, but it was a great time, great time. And like I said, I reforged that relationship with Colin as well, so... It was a really enjoyable year with Frank. Well, a few years with Frank, to be fair. And Colin Moore joined that season. Was he another one that immediately hit the ground running and, and you thought we've got a great player on our hands here? Stan, I've said this before and I've said this in interviews on podcasts and newspaper articles and everything else. That in my opinion, Stan is the best player I've played with. Stan Colin Moore is my equivalent of the original R9 Ronaldo. He had everything. He was a bit barking mad. Don't get me wrong. And he was another one where he was very selfish in what he did, but he had to be that person to get to get where he was. And like I say, that year when we got promotion, that year in the Premier League, it was scary. For two seasons, it was scary. I think he scored 50 goals in two seasons with us. And it was unbelievable. That's amazing to compare him to R9. Why do you not think that he, he, he hit the heights that he maybe should have? I don't know. I think it's well documented that Stan... I said he's had demons before and I think from now from when I hear him on the radio I think he's a fantastic interviewer I think he does fantastic articles for the radio and I think he's very very articulated in what he does I think he's learned to do that I think he was completely raw in what he did I've, you know, I've seen him stake one on Alfie Inga Harland on the training pitch to be fair when things weren't going well part of the course but no Stan was Stan was like I say he was an unbelievable player he was big strong score left foot right foot he was quick could head the ball. He had everything that a decent centre forward had to be. So you've come up with you know players like Colin Moore, yourself, Colin Cooper, Lars Bohinen, into the Premier League and finished third. Did you see that coming? No, not at all. We fancied us. You know, we, we went away to Manchester United and won two one. Uh, I don't think United had been beaten or conceded a goal in since Christmas or whatever it was, and that was a, that was a huge game. Like I say, going to Spurs and winning four. We just played some really, really attractive football. And it, at times, it was like, it was more of, even in the first division when Stan was playing for us, it was like, I've, I've, you've seen Team Wolf, where you just give give him the ball and just stand on the halfway line, wait for him to score and we'll wait to wait for kickoff. It was like that having Stan at times. Uh, so he was that good. We just used to try and get the ball to Stan uh, and then just let him get and do, do his thing. Was, so obviously you've played under Cluffy, who's unbelievably successful. What, and fitness aside, you've mentioned that already, what did Frank Clark do differently then? Was it a tactical or how was it different with him? Yeah, we did we did analysis and opposition. We did set plays. We did all the things that probably all the other clubs were doing years before <laughs> us. <laughs> so, so I don't think I don't think uh, Frank was a magician. He he signed some really good players uh, and got us organised. Uh, we, we had a style of play which was a little bit more fluid than what it was under Brian Clough. Brian Clough was very uh, counter attack. We sat deep. Uh, we had PC who could break from people who break from midfield, along with Stewart, who scored more goals than most midfield players at that time. But no, Frank's methods were with the ball, uh, being organised without the ball. But you know, we we trained, we trained properly, and we trained well. Frank Clark was a, a centre half like yourself. Won the Fairs Cup with Newcastle in 1969, their last ever trophy Newcastle won, and he was a European Cup winner. Did that help being a defender yourself? I think Frank was a left back, to be fair. Okay. Uh, I've spent a bit of time at left back, but you know, Frank's won a European Cup with Forest, and obviously Frank's been around uh, Brian before, and he knows the history of the football club. And I just think it helped all of us and helped the football club itself to have somebody that did have some kind of connection to what the, what it meant to be a Nottingham Forest player, and Nottingham Forest manager. So I think. That appointment was instrumental, really, in getting us back to where we needed to be. Yeah, that, that third place in the league, it qualified you for the UEFA Cup. And then you went on a, a run in that competition, getting to the quarterfinals where you were knocked out by Bayern. But that was a huge game for you, marking 
Papin, Klinsman, and you scored in the first leg in the Olympic Stadium. At the same end, Trevor Francis scored the winner. That must be the pinnacle of your career. Yeah, we lost. Uh, but it was, <laughs> it, was a, it was a highlight uh, highlight of a career. Yeah, obviously, I was, well, I'd watched the game against Malmo and Trevor Francis scored in that end near the shot put circle. But that team, the, the Munich team was mad, you know, Oliver Kahn in goal and Babel and Ziga and all these all these players were all international footballers and there's little old Nottingham Forest, you know, competing against them in the quarterfinals. You know, we went 1-0 down, Klinsman scores, then we equalise, we get beat 2-1 and we're, we're absolutely buzzing because we think, right, because we've done all this in the previous rounds, we beat Malmo at home, kept a clean sheet, uh, we beat Augsir away, kept a clean sheet at home, beat Leon. Uh, drew away from home, just didn't concede goals in Europe. And then we got beat five at home after th- really, really fancying ourselves. You know, what, what happened was we we went behind and we went chasing the game and they just absolutely picked us off and Papan and Klinsman just destroyed us that night. But like I say, to have a run in the UEFA Cup and play in Europe and play against these real, real elite international players was, was an absolute dream. When you're a kid, when you start playing, you never imagine you'd be doing something like that. I watched the... Um some of the highlights of the game in Munich and obviously watched your goal back. And I have to say, it's got to be one of the coolest celebrations I've ever seen for a goal. Can you remember what you it's, did? It's all, it's all, <laughs> come on. <laughs> I, like, I really like it. it, is a, it the, I think, I think everybody realised it, the shock of the goal, because I'm not the one that's supposed to score. We'd done this in the morning. Like I say, we'd organised set plays with Frank. We set this up in the morning that David Phillips is on the ball. I spin from the front round to the back. He clips it to me. I head it across the goal. And somebody has a tap in. But as it's come across, the spin on the ball, and I'm I must be a yard from the edge of the edge of the byline. Oliver Cohen has a has a waft at it, and I head it what I think is going to be across the box and goes in. And nobody's more surprised than me. <laughs> and my my wife was pregnant at the time. She is lying on the sofa trying trying not to be sick, trying to watch watching me score a goal. <laughs> you say no one's more surprised than you, but the the I forget who it was the commentator. It took him about ten minutes to register the board gone in. You take because it is such a strange angle that you've scored from. Yeah, if you see, I think some of the shots we see, I'm, I am off the pitch mm. when I think I'm still in the air. So it's really weird. And uh, mm. I didn't score many, mm. but it's one that everybody wants to talk mm. about. But again, most people really want to talk about my goals is the games where I got beaten. Mm. I, mean, I, I thought it was a cool celebration anyway. Just a oh, cheeky thank little nod. <laughs> <laughs> It brings us around nicely to 96, 97, which is, you know, the crux of our podcast. We're we're looking to speak to players from the 97 book. So the season started with a 4-1 loss at home to Sunderland. That's got to be alarm bells ringing, hasn't it? (laughs) (laughs) Not ever losing to Sunderland. (laughs) We lost lost to most people, to be fair, Matt. But Sunderland had just come up as well. Yeah, well, I say we, we. I can't honestly remember the year. I've done some research. I put some bits and pieces down. The people that came in, I, all I put down is we finished last. <laughs> That's just as much as I want to remember. But I'll have a go for you. I think we only won two games in the first fifteen or something like that, and we we're always up against you know up against the eight ball, really behind it. Uh, and it was really tough. We we never got any momentum. I think we won one game maybe every five or six, and you're never going to stay up. I think Stuart Pearce takes over in December. So presumably Clark was sacked. Yeah, obviously Frank, the results weren't great. Stuart came in, Stuart was obviously player coach, uh, but it was a weird one then because Stuart still kept himself in the player's dressing room. Uh, so it was a real weird having the manager still getting changed the next year and still training alongside you and then going back to the dressing room after. And there was no kind of real release for you. You know, you know what players are like. Players want to piss and moan about most things. And normally it's about the manager. And when it's sat next to you and things aren't going well, you know, you, know, you normally want to speak to somebody about something and you've got to be really careful your P's and your Q's and what you're saying so it was really a bit weird he, he took over in December he actually won January manager of the month so. yeah I know like I'm saying we have, you have that normal manager comes in oh Stuart Pearce is your manager you know is it indirectly you try a little bit harder I think we even got a result against Arsenal at home but uh, in the, again in the end weren't good enough to stay in the league that year there's a story about Stuart Pearce agonising over the team only for his wife to point out that he had 12 men on the pitch. Does that, does yeah. that sound like Piercy to you? Possibly. Uh, he'd have been in there twice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Apologies, we've invited you on to a show that talks about the season you finished bottom of the league. It's just That's just a coincidence, I'm, I'm afraid. But like you said, it, you bounce back thanks to the goals of Kevin Campbell and Pierre van Hooydonk. 
And then the summer of 98 got really interesting because a lot of players started to leave. Van Hooydonk tried to leave and was told in no uncertain terms he couldn't. And then he went on strike. Yeah, yeah well, Colin left, Kevin left, who were two massive attributes to our team. And Pierre, so he says, was promised things from the board to replace Kevin for better. Uh, we didn't obviously replace. Pierre took a stance to stay away. So he did that. Uh, we had a phone call when Pierre wanted to come back from, from the manager saying, listen, Pierre wants to come back in. Would you be prepared to meet him? So, you know, I was captain at the time and said, yeah, I'd be, I'd be prepared to meet him. I'd have to come in and sit down with the rest of the boys in the dressing room and say his reasons why. We understood his reasons why, but we just didn't see the stance that he took was the right one to try and help everybody else. So a few people said some things. I think Stoney got some stuff off his chest. I think Jeff got some stuff off his chest. You know, I tried to stay there and try and be impartial because obviously he's come back in this. But, you know, he, he had his he had his uh, strike period. He came back. And then, obviously, when he did come back and celebrate a goal against Derby, he celebrated by himself. So it was a bit of a strange one for him. You know, he must have felt really strange as well. It was strange for us, but he must have felt really weird coming to address him and trying to explain himself and then play in front of a set of 20,000 fans that were banging for your blood as well because of what he did. So when he returned, was he blanked in the dressing room by his teammates? Uh, not officially blanked, I think, because when you... In the dressing room, it was tough. Like I say, people had their say with him. But on the pitch, you know, we still got to try and fight for survival and try and do the make the best of, the best of a bad you know, situation, which which is what it was really. What was it like the year before? Were the signs that I mean, obviously he's he's annoyed, he's gone on strike. Did that surprise you? Was it was there sort of behaviour before that which suggested he was a bit of an oddball? Or no, but he was, from what I understand, he was a bit of a a hot head at Celtic as well. I've heard stories that he's done things at Celtic, which were, you know, which aren't uh, supposed to be done, shall we say? But. I didn't see it coming. No, obviously we had a great year. Myself and Kevin were fantastic players, scored lots of goals, got us where we need to be. But uh, listen, continental players are very headstrong, very opinionated, and in the end, basically do what they want to do. You know, we're very conservative, the English, and we stiff up a lip and just get on with it and everything else. But continental players have a bit more uh, bigger bollocks, shall we say? <laughs> it's an amazing situation, though. I mean. It happens sometimes in the modern game. A player says he's not happy and he, he wants to move on and he, he threatens to not play, but it rarely ever, the standoff rarely ever reaches a point where the player doesn't actually play. When he first said he was going to go on strike, Steve, as captain, did you attempt to re- resolve the situation? Well, there was no, he never, he never ever came in and said, I'm going on strike. He just didn't come in. Okay. So it was just a case of he just didn't come in. So there was nothing there. And then obviously we found out what had happened. Uh, nobody, nobody chased it. Uh, didn't really didn't really know what to do to be fair and then like I say I just got the message they wanted to come back and try and explain himself and then we had to deal with the consequences of that afterwards what was Dave or I believe he likes to be known as Harry Bassett like Harry uh talked an awful lot Harry I liked Harry Harry was really good for me he did he did great for me he even rescued me in 99 when I was struggling for a club when the Platt area arrived at Forest uh, but Harry was good Harry was great in the championship I think the premiership was maybe a step too far for Harry and, you know, of, of how the game was. Uh, but Harry was really good with me. I, I enjoyed working with him. I uh, enjoyed working with Forrest and at Barnsley. But his, the, my, the biggest problem he had with Harry was half-time. Harry would come in at half-time and try and iron out any problems, but he wouldn't stop talking from the minute you sit down till the time when the bell goes. So you ain't got a fucking clue what's gone <laughs> off at the beginning of the conversation. Just have to try and work it out for yourself. <laughs> That rings true. I can picture his conversations on Match of the Day where he just keeps on going and going and going and going. Yeah. Can't get worse. There's, t- there's times in this times in room when Jeff Thomas just said, Harry, take a fucking breath. <laughs> <laughs> so after Harry, I believe it was a huge 90s name, Big Ron came in. Is that correct? Ron Atkinson? Yeah. No, nope. not for me. I think no. I think with Ron. Yes, he did. Yeah, yeah he yes. came in. Cr- 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 chronologically, yes, but not for me. He came in and immediately in his first game went into the wrong dugout which isn't yeah, a good start Arsenal yeah he, he sat in a dugout with superstars thought why the fuck are we bought with the league <laughs> <laughs> yeah so there's that and, and obviously Ron came in and Ron was still joining in five sides and playing left wing and doing double lollipops in the five sides uh, even at his fine age I didn't I didn't I didn't have a didn't have a lot of uh, dealings with Ron to be fair he dropped me for some games he brought other people in to play my position so yeah, and it, it, it just didn't work for me, to be fair. <laughs> Incredible. Incredible. Ron, 
tell me about Ron joining in training, please, because that's a, a mental image. I'd, well, you, obviously, we all know Ron's of a certain shape. We all know Ron's of a certain age, and we all know his his hairdressers of a certain disposition, shall we say? And he <laughs> ca- carries most of his hair around in a bag. <laughs> but uh, he just used to play. He used to join in. He used to enjoy himself so much in joining in. Did he have a bit still, or was it was it past that? Uh, no, he didn't have a bit. He just used to stand on the ring and every, every now and again just touch it. But he had a he had a running with Pierre one day as well. So he used to he used to do the uh, the adverts for I think coming what beer it was where there was the like medieval time and Ron was in the adverts. All right. And uh, Pierre gave him one. Oh, you just like your advert. You're a pub manager. Give him a quote to that one day. Oh. <laughs> In the end, though, it, it did go a little bit full circle as you were managed by a clough again when you were reunited with Nigel at Burton. Yeah, I was. We were only part-time at Burton. Uh, we went in the, the new Pirelli Stadium and Nigel's training methods were straight out of his dad's catalogue of coaching schemes. <laughs> uh, we used to play football, cricket, five-a-sides and just basically because the lads had been at work all day, they'd come in in the evenings, Tuesday, Thursdays. I uh, just used to enjoy our football. I enjoyed the year playing in the, you know, as as it is now the conference. Uh, and then again, obviously, Nigel was going with a younger group. I was getting older, still having recurrent back problems, which I'd had since I was being about mid-20s, uh, and ended up playing at Ilkeston Town for a year, non-league, with Nigel Jempson, which is enough to finish anybody <laughs> off. Uh, so then I ended up packing up playing after that and working on my coaching career. Tell us about your, your recent fundraising efforts then. You're, you're obviously involved at, at Basford FC and we're going to donate to your, your charity efforts. You're looking to raise £10,000 for, for Mind and for the club itself, which does great things in your, your local area. It does. We're, you know, we're, there's two sides to the football club. Baseford United Football Club is obviously the, the first team uh, in the academy that we run as well. But Baseford United Community Football Club is the junior section. Uh, obviously, football at the moment is on its knees. Uh, there's no income coming in. We have over 500 kids in our in our system uh, that aren't playing any football and there's no revenue coming into the club. So for basically Community Football Club and obviously Mind Charity, we're trying to raise as much money as we can by staying active, by active being mentally and physically. I can't get to a point now where I can go out and run, but I walk every day and I've now bought myself a road bike where I can cycle. So we're trying to raise funds for, for both of those, to be fair, Martin Rich and you know, very, very thankful for your donations. Really well received. I really appreciate what you're doing. And we're trying to get everybody active. We're just trying to keep everybody positive. You know, being exercised physically is also great for you mentally. Just get out there, grab a mate. You're allowed to walk with one mate. Grab a mate, have a talk, have a walk. So, so, so important. And ex- exercise is, is really key. And that's a great thing that you're doing. And we'll put full details in the show description. So if people want to donate, having enjoyed listening to you speak, then they'll be able to do that. Thank you very much. Cheers, fellas. We've got a few sort of leftover miscellaneous questions, which I wouldn't mind. Just one, which Go I don't on. know if it's an amusing one or not, but when you're Forest captain, have you put yourself on penalties? Yes, because <laughs> <laughs> I've seen you smashing in with your. I, left I foot. could never get. I could never get on penalties while Stuart was here. I could never get on penalties while Pierre was here. So during that season, I scored two penalties. I even remember them both: one against Villa, one against Southampton. And I was always fifty to one first goal. My uncle every game put a pound on me, fifty to one. And won twice in the season. <laughs> Happy days. You didn't tap it in either. No, no, it, it, it was uh, it wasn't cultured, shall we say? It was never going. It was never going to be short of the line. One thing also that we want to ask everyone who comes on our show, bearing in mind this podcast is called Searching for Shinies, we'd like you to tell us who your shiny would be. So this is the best player that you've played with or against in your career. Uh, Stan Collymore would be a big shiny that I played with. And Eric Cantona would be the biggest shiny I've played against. Wow. Unbelievable. Eric Cantona had literally had everything. You wouldn't you wouldn't realise how big Eric Cantona is. I'm 6'2", and he was, he was bigger than me, wider than me. And listen, everybody's seen it on the TV and everything else. He was unbelievable. And to go that year uh, when we beat United away 2-1, when they haven't been beaten all year, to beat them in that, that fantastic year we had was, fun, was great. It was really, really great. Yeah. They, they don't get much shinier than Eric. <laughs> no, true. So that was Steve Chettle and just the 319 players left to go and how good it is to have the likes of Cluffy and Gaza covered in our pilot podcast. It's an amazing start, but now you know the journey has begun. We've done our pilot episode, we've got Chettle. We need to try and find the other 319. So if you know a player in the 1997 Merlin Premier League sticker book, please get in touch. I've scanned the entire book on our website, searchingforshinies.com. You can tweet us at the shiny pod or contact us on Instagram at the shiny pod and you know 
if you've got any old 1997 Merlin Premier League stickers gathering dust in the loft, send us them in because we're also trying to complete our physical book too. Please subscribe to the podcast, rate us. We'd love a, a shiny five-star review and tell anyone else who, who you might have done swaps with in the playground 25 years ago. They might appreciate an hour and a bit of Steve Chattel Chat. Thanks everyone for listening and we'll see you again next week.